All right, so as I said, my name is Anne Five Palmer. I'm the Annual Fund and Membership Manager here at the Arboretum Foundation. Welcome to Inside the Arboretum. Our hope for this presentation is to give you an inside peek into the Washington Park Arboretum from the comfort of your home, wherever you are around the world. I'd like you to take a moment now to pause. And you might close your eyes and imagine your favorite place in the Arboretum or a park near you. It's important to remember that when we're in the Arboretum and in Seattle <clears throat> and the surrounding areas that we're on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people and that they are the original stewards of this land since time immemorial. Please join us in thanking and acknowledging the caretakers of this land, past, present, and future. And this is just one small way in which the foundation seeks to be in alignment with the land and the people of the land. Now, before I turn it over to the presenters, I'd like to explain the function of our three partner organizations, the City of Seattle, University of Washington Botanic Gardens, and the Arboretum Foundation. This land belongs to the city of Seattle. Seattle Parks and Recreation takes care of the paths, the lawns, and the structures in the Arboretum. The University of Washington Botanic Gardens owns and cares for the extensive plant collection, which consists of 40,000 plant specimens, representing 4,300 species and varieties from every continent except for Antarctica. The Arboretum Foundation was founded almost 90 years ago, our birthday is next year, to raise the funds necessary to promote, protect, maintain, and advocate for the Arboretum. We help to fund the University of Washington Botanic Gardens, horticulturists and arborists, as well as providing or supporting educational and cultural programming in both the Arboretum and the Seattle Japanese Garden. And now, without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic to Katherine Nelson, perhaps a familiar face to some of you who may have joined her free monthly tours on first Thursdays at 1130. Katherine, I will turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Katherine Nelson. Um, I uh, put together a presentation um, today called The Walk Down Arboretum Lane. I'll get that started and then I will tell you a little bit more about myself. I have been with the Arboretum Giving Tours for 17 years now. Um, six of those as a volunteer and then I was hired part-time to coordinate the tour program. Um, it sounds like a long time that I'm never bored um, and I'm always learning things and I'm always having great conversations and interactions with the staff and visitors. To your left of the screen, you'll see one of our maps here and I'm gonna leave that on the screen for orientation while you're watching, just so you know where we are at. We're gonna take about a mile's walk from the Ground Visitor Center down this road to the uh, Road to Denver and Glen, that's about a mile's walk. Um, as I'm talking about each point um, along Arboretum Drive where we're at, you'll see these little orange arrows. So hopefully that'll help you orient yourself and I'll also try to describe. There's just some lovely pictures of Arboretum Drive yesterday. Snipes, um, sorry, I forgot. I'm going to, I would like to show you everything along Arboretum Drive because there's many, many things, but I'm gonna focus on five plants that represent uh, what we do here at the Arboretum. Um, we have historical legacy trees, uh, a native plant, um, a plant used by human beings, um, a cultivar that was created here in the Arboretum and a plant that's a conservation plant. Thank you for your patience, here we go. As you walk past the visitor center and head south, you will come to our historic elms. They are located at the first cross crossing path. 
that crosses Arboretum Drive. And if you turn to the right and look at that path, each elm will be on either side of the path. One is Ulmus Americana or the American elm, and the other is Ulmus Latus or European elm, et cetera. There's several names. They are both American species. The Ulmus Latus or European white elm is the Roosevelt elm. And it was planted by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1938 when she was the first lady. She was visiting here. And um, if you see where my cursor is, you can see the note on the original accession card. And the date, March 4th, 1938. Also in the picture, there's a, or the corner, there's a picture here of Eleanor planting a tree also in 1938, but at a different university. <clears throat> but I thought it was a good graphic. Our second um, historical elm is the Olmus Americana or Liberty Elm. This elm is a cutting of a cutting of a cutting of this original elm that stood in Cambridge Common in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and it was purported to be the tree that George Washington took command of the Continental, Car Continental Army under in 1938. It's a crazy story. This original elm you see here in the pictures failed in the 1920s um, and thousands of cuttings were taken from it and grown and sent to arboretums all over the United States. So several states have this historic elm that was there at the beginning of our country. This is our Olmus Americana. Um, you can see on the left is a spring picture and on the right is the current picture. And again, there's the accession car. This was our original database. Turning ahead to walk south down Arboretum Drive a little further, we will pass the Woodland Garden. There's a big sign on the right that says Woodland Garden. So when you're there, can't miss it. We have the second largest collection of Japanese maple cultivars in the United States. Um, this beautiful wooded glen also features birch and native conifers, ferns, and water plants, and a few hydrangeas in summer. Continue to walk down Arboretum Drive. We will walk through our magnolia collection that features both American, North American species and Asiatic species. We will pass our Sorbus collection, which is again, one of our main collections. It'll be on your left. Sorbus are also called mountain ash. Um, and in England, they're referred to as the Rowan tree, if that is a better reference for you. And we come to the next tree I'm going to talk about. You'll see at the map on the left that there's arrows all over. I wanted to indicate that these trees are all over the park. There's thousands of them. Um, the Western Red Cedar is our iconic Pacific Northwest tree. Um, Thuya plicata is the Latin name, and the lower Lushutseed word for it is Chapayas, as you can see on the screen there. Some of the Western Red Cedars in the park were planted, but most have grown back from, um, from logging. Are some good pictures of the Western Red Cedar. I'm sure you recognize this tree. It has lovely um, striated strips of bark that are sort of a deep reddish brown. And often it has these sort of J-curved branchings. It also has um, very bright green compressed needles or leaves and, um, and little tulipy cones. We've got some spring cones here, all green, and then some fall cones. The western red cedar cones up every year and then um, drops, it shatters its cones and drops them. So they aren't, or they aren't present always year round and are not necessarily a good identification for the tree. I threw in this picture, many of you have probably stopped at this rest stop on I-5 I North. Um, I wanted you to get an idea of how big these trees uh, were before logging started. This tree is purported to be about a thousand years old when it was cut down and we can believe that the Western Red Cedars can live much longer than that. And then we come back to 
um, the Salish nations and their reverence for this tree. As I said, um, in their language, which is pronounced Wilshootseed, I'm not pronouncing it as well as I could, sorry. The name is Chapayat, and Chapayat means tree of life. And every um, native civilization has a uh, iconic tree that represents many, many things about their culture. Our Salish cultures use this tree for everything but food. Um, I've put some, excuse me, I've put some little um, graphics here so you can get a good idea. Um, the bark was used for um, mats, clothing, um, rope, hats, and a variety of things. The green leaves or the dried needles and leaves could be made into a tea. There uh, are really great compounds in this uh, tree that are healthful for your bronchial system. So if you had a cold, boil some water and put some, um, steep some leaves in there. The wood was used for many things. As you can see here, there's these wonderful little boxes that they could fold, um, wet and fold. Um, it was used for timber. The timber was used to uh, build their uh, iconic longhouses, which are very large buildings. Now, because this tree has many antifungal and antibacterial properties, it's perfect for our wet boreal forest environment, keeps things from rotting. And then lastly, the roots could be used for basketry. Well, we're back on um, south on um, Arboretum Drive. And as you walk down the street, you will see the Forest Fiddleheads preschool classrooms on either side. Um, the kids are outdoors in the morning. And right when you get to this, we're gonna take a little jog off of Arboretum Drive. Right when you get to the preschool, either before or after, you wanna turn right or left, no, sorry, right or west, no, <laughs> west, and walk down to the next parallel path and you'll see our new sculpture. Union by John Grade was installed a couple of months ago. Uh, the funds for this were raised by the Arboretum Foundation. Um, and this lovely, amazing sculpture um, is hung in a grove of eight Western red cedars, because that is a tree that inspired um, the artist, Mr. Grade, to create the sculpture. What you see are nets with these little bits of resin, a uh, green and a blue one, um, and they are in union together. And this inset is a close-up of those resin pieces. Um, each of those will represent uh, cellular tissue, uh, what cells of the cambium tissue of the tree would look like under a microscope. I highly recommend this beautiful sculpture. Then we're gonna go back up to Arboretum Drive and we're gonna walk south just a little bit and we were coming to the Mediterranean collection. Um, you will maybe recognize that by some obvious uh, Mediterranean plants like small olive trees and rock rose. The tree I wanted to feature here, there's actually three of them <clears throat> right in here to your left um, on Arboretum Drive is the cork oak or Quercus super. This tree has been used by humans to create bottle stoppers and other products for, well, at least as far back as Egyptian culture, if not farther. It's got great spongy bark. It's, I always recommend people go up and kind of poke at the bark and you could feel the corkiness of it. Um, that's actually material called suberin. That's why it's called the Quercus or oak, super or cork. I just thought I'd add some pictures of cork harvesting and explain a little bit about how you can peel the bark off of a tree without damaging or killing the tree. That's very, very unusual. These cork oaks are native to the Northern Mediterranean. And as I said, they've been used for centuries and centuries by humans. You can see here, there's a person um, on the left and he is using an ax and he is peeling the bark off. In the center, that's what the cork cambium looks like when it's exposed, when the bark's been removed. It's this intense orangey, sort of almost purpley color sometimes. And then in the bottom right corner, you see a pile of cork bark sections, which are being dried. They're dried before they go to the cork maker and um, then they're processed after that.
We're going to keep walking down Arboretum Drive, walking south, and just after we leave the cork tree, you're going to see the Sequoia Dendron Giganteum, or Giant Sequoia. You can't miss it because it's giant. It is um, the largest species of tree on Earth by mass, not height. That distinction goes to its cousin, the coastal redwood. After you pass the redwood, you're going to walk through our legume section uh, on one side, on the left, and our peonies on the right. Um, legume trees include things in the pea family like locust trees um, and golden rain trees. And we're going to come to our fourth plant, Mahonia ex media Arthur menzies. This is a plant that was discovered in the arboretum. It had hybridized from two different plants, a gentleman named Arthur Menzies with the Seattle, or excuse me, the San Francisco Botanic Garden sent our nursery flats and flats of different species of Mahonia seedlings. While they were living in the nursery, two of them apparently cross-pollinated, um, dropped a seed and a new cultivar grew from that. Cultivar is a cultivated variety and I can explain that more if you want later. The seedlings were um, arrived here in 1961. And when this new plant was discovered and the Arboretum got naming rights, the very first article about it to share this plant with the rest of the world was in the fall 1967 Arboretum Foundation Bulletin. So some cool stuff. This is a beautiful tree shrub. They get to be about 12 feet tall and maybe 10 feet wide-ish. Um, it's got really cool texture. Uh, you can see it's got these spiky yellow flowers. They're blooming right now. And the big bonus is hummingbirds. Um, they love the nectar of this tree. And if you stand by uh, one of these shrub, Mahonia shrubs right now, you will probably see several of them fighting over it. These are photographs, sorry, of our Anna's hummingbirds. They're one of our native hummingbirds and they overwinter here. Back down Arboretum Drive, we come to our last stop, Rhododendron Glen, which is just below our Camellia collection, again, to your right or west. Uh, Rhododendron Glen was designed and um, by the Olmsted brothers. It was planted in 1938, and then again, it was renovated in 1922 with funds that were raised by the Arboretum Foundation. A lot of invasives were taken out, a lot of beautiful new plants were added. Um, and it's just a lovely place to sit. This view's from the bench up above. Um, the tree I wanna talk about next in our last plant is a conservation plant. It is, da -da -da -da, there are several of them. Is my, right here in the middle, where my cursor's pulling up and down. It is the Metasequoia glyptostraboides, Dawn Redwood, um, or in Chinese, it is uh, its name is translated as water fir. So quite a fascinating plant. It was sort of the discovery of the century in botany in the early 1940s. Um, before that, we only knew of this plant through fossil records and paleobotany. In 1941, several Japanese botanists were in uh, Lichuan Forest in uh, southwestern China, and they found living groves of this tree. Um, it was amazing. They call it a Lazarus, Lazarus taxon um, to indicate that it has come back to life. Um, and sometimes it's called a living fossil because as I said, it was only known through fossil records and now we know it's not extinct. Again, on your right are pictures of our trees in Rhododendron Glen. Those were uh, grown from seed that was collected by the Arnold Arboretum in Massachusetts. Uh, they were germinated and thousands were sent to arboretums all over the country. So this plant is not only no longer extinct, it exists all over um, different countries and arboretums and parks. Oh. I just wanted to point out that the Don Redwood is a really unique conifer in that it is deciduous. So uh, the green leaves you see here come out new and in the early spring and they're very soft and bright. And then this time of year in the fall, as you can see in the middle photograph, 
Um, the leaves start to turn this sort of a coppery, rusty color and they drop. Um, there's not many conifers that lose their leaves, but there are several. And lastly, there's just a cute one of its cute little cones. Um, thank you very much for listening. Sorry about my couple of fumbles there. Um, many of you have probably been to the Arboretum. Those of you who, who haven't, or those of you that want to come back, maybe you're intrigued by what I talked about, please join us for one of our free public walks. Um, many of the things I discussed, um, I have provided links to articles, more elaborate articles to Anne Fife, and she can forward those to you later. But I do want to invite you um, to one of our free public tours. They are given the first Thursday of every month. Um, from 11.30 p.m. and we go to 1 p.m. We meet at the Graham Visitor Center and then myself and or Cynthia Welty, my coworker, lead everybody out to talk about uh, something seasonal or a specific plant collection or um, something about botany, like fall color, why does that happen? Um, again, thank you very much for your time and I guess I should turn this over for questions. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was wonderful. I'm going to remove spotlight and uh, open up for any questions. If you can enter your questions into the chat, that would be super helpful. And I'll read um, anything that I see come in. But I do have one while y'all are typing or thinking. I have one for Catherine. Um, wondering how long it takes for a cork tree to kind of grow in between cycles of of, uh, of harvesting the cork. Are you? Mm -hmm. do you know? Yeah, um, 10 to 15 years per tree. It takes that long for the cork to grow, the new bark, sorry, to grow thick enough to harvest. Um, and then typically um, the cork orchards are owned by families. They've been owned for generations and generations and they have a specific group of trees that they harvest each year. So they move in sort of a round robin from group to group, thereby moving back to the original group of trees. Um, and hopefully the cork's grown back. Great, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Anyone have any questions? I see um, I see one, do you know why the, tall co the fall colors have seemed so much more dramatic vi or vivid this year than the last several years? Uh, well, there's several factors that affect fall color. That pigment is usually in the leaf, hidden by the chlorophyll, and when the chlorophyll stops producing, those colors come out. However, um, some of the pigment colors are intensified by weather, uh, sun exposure, uh, temperature, and water. So there's, depending on the tree and what the weather's like, you get a variety or a, a sort of a complexity of reasons for um, the color intensity. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any more questions, but if anyone, um, go ahead and... Um, enter them in as we switch to our next presenter and I can um, circle back when, when David's done. And I am gonna go ahead and pop into the chats, the links I entered earlier um, for more information about Giving Tuesday uh, and the Arboretum. And now I um, would like to welcome David Zuckerman. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. And Hi, Sam Fife. Hello, all. Can everyone hear me? Hopefully. Good. My name is David Zuckerman. My, my horticulture career with the University of Washington Botanic Gardens spanned over four decades from 1982 to this year. I retired um, July 1st. That's 40 years of the Arboretum's 90 year history which we'll be celebrating next year. Yoo-hoo! I plan to remain engaged as the staff emeritus volunteer as the Arboretum and the Center for Urban Horticulture have been my homes away from home for a very long time. My talk is titled Trees Tell Stories, which will also include an introduction on those of us who care for the trees in the Arboretum. You may have heard the Arboretum is maintained by elves that come out at night. 
Well, to set the record straight, we are out during the day. Why would we work at night when you can't see? To begin, it's important to dis distinguish an arboretum from a park. An arboretum contains a documented plant collection. We call our plant records. And our collections are utilized for research, education, conservation, interpretation, and display. Our plant records, as Catherine showed our old catalog cards, provide much of the foundation and background for our tree stories. Now, if you've read my Hobbit tree story, you know their plant records are sketchy at best. We don't know their origin, which lends them an aura of mystique given their unusual hobbit, oh, habit, sorry. Call it Arboretum lore, which is a fun mixture of fact, fiction, and a little elf magic mixed in. And if you visit the hobbit trees, your experience may open up a whole new personal story that you can pass along to your family and friends. Now a bit more on our Cracker Jack University of Washington horticulture crew, which hovers around 15 staff members now, thanks to the recent generous grants from our partner Arboretum Foundation. Of course, we can't forget our parks partner. They provide at least another five staff along with a huge outside support team, irrigation, plumbers, electricians, and, and so forth. So there can be as many as 20 passionate elves, most with backgrounds in horticulture, working in the Arboretum during the day. We have several specialized positions, which include our curator of living collections, Ray Larson, steers our arc through thick and thin, he sets our plant collection policy, and he leads project development. Our new manager of horticulture, Joanna Long, manages the daily University of Washington Arboretum maintenance and operations. Our ground supervisor, Roy Farrow, supports the crew on the ground and leads projects. We have two arborists, Shea Cope and Lincoln Urbeck, they lead and conduct the technical side of our boriculture program, mostly via climbing our trees. And we have a plant health care specialist, Ryan Garrison, who leads our plant health care program. Lastly, all our staff members are assigned to a specific plant collection or special garden in the Arboretum. Our 2002 master plan called out for 40 horticulturists to care for our plant collections of our stature and prominence, given our 230 acres and intensity of gardening needed. Thankfully, us elves work our magic to make up for this staffing shortfall. It's called volunteering. Yes, we have a robust volunteer program managed by both the Arboretum Foundation and the University of Washington Botanic Gardens that offers something for everyone wanting to help us out. So if you're interested in volunteering, please reach out to us. For horticulture, you can become a garden steward who work alongside our horticulturists, or if you have hort experience and prefer a more independent role, you can sign up to be a dedicated independent gardener, or DIG, as we call them. Now, our golden oak. If you've read its story, you know it's a rare cultivar, Concordia, of the English oak that beckons all at the north end of our three-quarter mile long promenade and Olmsted legacy, Azalea Way. Here's a plant healthcare story for you. Back in the late 1990s, we encountered an aphid-like pest that was defoliating many of our oaks, including the golden oak. 
we were quite concerned. We quickly learned it was a newly introduced pest called oak phylloxera. We now easily control it with annual monitoring and if needed, a dormant, non-toxic and environmentally friendly horticultural oil application to smother the eggs and, and the insects. It's indeed a sentinel tree among our APGA nationally accredited oak collection and a priority for us to keep healthy. Another nationally accredited plant collection is our magnolias, one of my favorites. Carhaix's Bell is a staff favorite located in the mid-era section of our Puget Sound rhododendron hybridizers display just off Azalea Way. Developed at Carhaix's Castle in Cornwall, England, it's a cross between Magnolia sargentiana variety robusta, which has the largest saucer type flowers, I, I kid you not, they're this big, and the hybrid diva. It's simply stunning in full bloom. And check out the cool bird's eye view taken via drone. I accompanied Skylar Lynn, a UW architecture student and aerial photographer in 2021, where we conducted an aerial tram tour of the Arboretum. Our one and only national champion tree, Pacific crabapple, or Gaat in the Chutsi language, crowned in 2018 by the American Forests National Tree Program. Points are awarded for tree for trunk girth, height, and crown spread measurements. And you may be aware we have over 75 state champion trees that we just finished measuring, remeasuring, and submitting to our state registry. Hopefully they'll remain champions. This outstanding crabapple tree located across from the Grand Visitor Center on the path towards the Winter Garden predates Arboretum history and hence our plant records. We guesstimate it to be at least 100 years old. It's featured in the Growing Old Project, which highlights many of our urban canopy forests from the perspective of our indigenous peoples. Our dancing maples. These two iconic Arboretum big leaf maples, located at the north end of our Mount Nash collection, also predate our history as an Arboretum. I've always known them to be our dancing maples, and I vaguely remember a former education staff member coining them Fred and Ginger. But don't hold me to that. Your guess is as good as mine as to which one is Fred and which is Ginger. You may have read about big leaf maple decline in the Pacific Northwest. It's a syndrome attributed to climate change. In this case, our longer, drier, warmer period. It's currently under research, within our School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. The good news is that we currently haven't confirmed BLMD or big leaf maple decline in the Arboretum, but our arborists have confirmed a plant pathogen called sooty bark disease on several of our maples. Thankfully, Fred and Ginger remain healthy in large part because of their health insurance with our plant docs, Shay, Lincoln, and Ryan. Other plant collections that we attribute to climb to due to climate change include our pines, our hemlocks, birches, and cedars. A living fossil discovered growing in Willemi National Park, New South Wales, Australia in 1994 is the Willemi pine, Willemia nobilis. We've received several young specimen trees as donations 
that have been planted and growing well in rhododendron glen. They're IUCN list, red listed, which is the International Union of for conservation of nature as critically endangered. The, the Wolemi pine is a close, it's not a pine, but it's a close relative of the monkey puzzle tree, Oracaria oricana, which is also endangered in the mountains of Southern Chile, where the Mapuche tribe lives. Conservation plant collections are of utmost importance for arboreta and botanic gardens. My last slide is a photo of my favorite place in Seattle to experience fall color at its best, Woodland Garden, home to our extensive Japanese maple collection. However, don't take my word for it. Check it out yourself. Yeah, you'll, you, you, it were past peak, you'll now have to wait another year to see it in peak color. Don't let that stop you from visiting the Arboretum throughout the year, as it always has something to offer each and every day. Maybe you'll discover a tree with a story that is yet to be told, which may become Arboretum lore for all to enjoy and discover. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Such great info from both of you. And I again want to open up the, the floor for, for questions. So I'm, I'm hoping you all have at least a couple questions. And the way to ask them is to enter in the chat. Uh, and I see one coming in, so I'll read that in one sec. Uh, but if you know, it, it, in the bottom of your Zoom screen, there should be an option to hit chat, and then you can type in your question and hit enter. And I see this question. Uh, well, they can't thank you enough, David and Catherine, for your many years of dedication, along with all team members. So many highlights in the Arboretum. Love the, the Magnolias too, and such an exciting future indeed. I'll mention more about that in the end of our talk. Which area do you want to see become a major focus next? And I, I think I'd like to hear from David first and then Catherine, if you want to jump in after. Yeah, so Sue, um, you may be aware that Crabapple Meadow is currently under a new design and fundraising for the implementation of it. And it's I think going to be an amazing space for events. And it will include our old um, field nursery. Um, and there's some incredible specimens that we just weren't able to transplant in time to, to you know, their respective collection areas in the Arboretum that remain, and I'm hoping we have a tree spade that the Arboretum Foundation um, purchased for us. It can it can dig a 50 inch tree ball, um, so we can save our backs and have a machine do it. And I'm hoping that some of these older specimens that are in the uh, the old field nursery that will become part of this meeting space um, can be moved um, for all to enjoy. But that, that's exciting. I was able to participate in some of the early um, design work, and I hope I can stay involved in, uh, in some of the future um, development as well. But that, that's, that's something to look forward to in the not so distant future. Thanks, David. Catherine, do you wanna? Oh, I'd have to say that. Uh, Pacific Connections Garden. I was lucky enough to um, be here when they planted the New Zealand forest and saw it go from little tiny plants you could barely see in the wood chips to just being all amazing and filled in and these shrubs and beautiful um, sedges. Um, and I believe the next forest to be installed is the Chinese forest. So I'm really mm -hmm. looking forward to that. Um, that's one of my favorite spots in the Arboretum is the Pacific Connection Garden. And for those of you who don't know, it features 
five Pacific Rim countries in temperate zones, uh, and each has a display garden of plants from those countries that we typically use, and then each one is going to have a natural forest. So the New Zealand forest was created with plants grown from seed that was collected wild in New Zealand. So I'm looking forward to the next forest that we get to install. Wonderful, thanks Catherine and David. Um, another question that came in about when is peak season? I believe this is directed at you, David. I'm sure you might be able to add Catherine, but peak, I'm, I'm assuming that's peak season of foliage. Um, but um, Bill, if you wanna enter if that's different understanding. If it is um, peak color season, it, it varies. Um, this year it was actually late, um, typically right around Halloween is when uh, at least the arboretum color is peaking. Um, but, you know, depending on our weather, uh, temperature, um, and it, can, it can be before or after. And I'll add that uh, in the Japanese garden, the maple festival this year was from a, um, October 5th through 15th. So that was seen as a peak time for the maple viewing. Uh, but that the color there was, you know, pretty amazing the whole month of October. Catherine, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think David's about right. Late October, early November, we, um, our November free weekend walk was featuring fall color and there were still enough um, beautiful leaves left on the trees at that point, but they kind of blew off after uh, the first <laughs> Thursday in November. <laughs> yeah, some big winds, didn't we? Yeah. So I see um, the question, how many camellia cultivars and how old are they? That's a David question. Oh, goodness. Well, <laughs> I'd have to look that up. Um, <laughs> we have lots, lots, hundreds. You can go actually to the University of Washington Botanic Gardens website and um, there's a, a portal for all of our collections. You can type in camellia and all the camellias, camellias will come up. We also have, as most of you may know, an interactive map. So they'll come up on the map. And if you want to look at them, um, you know, during their flowering period, um, you can take that map and, and look around Ooh, while you're in, in the Arboretum. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Kathy. I was just going to say the interactive map was what I used for my graphic for pointing where we were going mm -hmm. down our drive. And when you're on your computer, you can zoom on it. You can search for plants. You can zoom on an area and see what's there. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so most of our camellias are in the, uh, well, camellia collection, our Taceae, which is the tea family. Um, we have the Franklin tree and the Stuartias that are also related to camellias in that area. It's, it's incredible um, year round. Um, and then, you know, the camellias, we have a lot of early bloomers, you know, winter winter bloomers, um, and then they go through spring, and um, it's quite a um, quite a national collection. And I think our strengths are in a particular, um, well, mostly cultivars, um, but we do have several species of camellias as well. Great, thanks, so, thanks, you all. So, so species are blooming right now. Can you repeat that name again? Um, Sasanqua mm -hmm. species Maybe of familiar are blooming right now. The Japonica um, bloom in the spring. So great, thank you. Yeah, I see a couple more questions. Um, I do want to just say a couple closing things, and then we can go back to a couple last questions just to catch everyone. Um, actually, I'm going to. Um, Thank the presenters and, and stop the